everyone for Zooming in tonight. We have a really exciting um, talk ahead of us. As, let's see, Stephen, can you mute yourself, please? Um, so I think we're uh, almost ready to begin. So I want to welcome everyone to this talk. We are really excited to host um, the second conversation in our speaker series. That's part of our current show, um, Interpreting the Natural Contemporary Visions of Scholars Rocks at the Korean Cultural Center. Um, if you're not familiar with the Korean Cultural Center, they're located in New York City. It's a government institution that was inaugurated in 1979 to establish and promote Korean culture and aesthetics in New York City. The Korean Cultural Center is a branch of the Ministry of Cult Culture, Sports and Tourism of Korea, and it provides diverse cultural and artistic activities, including gallery exhibitions, performing arts concerts, film festivals, and educational programs. The current ex exhibition is part of the Korean Cultural Center's annual Call for Artists program that selects talented artists and their artworks, as well as guest curated exhibitions to be presented at Gallery, Gallery Korea each year. Since, um, night, since the Korean Cultural Center celebrated its 40th anniversary last year, I'd love to share a short video to introduce the span of the work that's been accomplished over the last 40 years. Next, I'd like to um, introduce our talk tonight. Um, this, talk will this talk is called Portals, Collecting and Interpreting Evocative Rocks. This talk will focus on the art of stone collecting, both as a historic tradition and as a contemporary practice, uh, why contemporary artists have translated this aesthetic into new forms, and how each individual rock speaks about a larger landscape will be addressed in our talk tonight. If you missed the talk from last week, I've put the link in the chat and that takes you to the webpage on the Korean cultural site where you can see all five conversations. And if you click on the first one, you'll see a recording. And this, this um, presentation is being recorded. Um, it will be posted on YouTube and it will be shared publicly um, and all our talks will. So. Um, check back onto the website for a recording. So for tonight, I'd like to um, introduce our guests and then we'll get started. So tonight we're very, very honored to have with us um, our four distinguished guests. We have Thomas Elias, the chairman of the Viewing Stone Association of North America and the honorary vice chairman of the Viewing Stone Association of China. He's the former director of the National Arboretum in Washington, DC, and professor of botany at Claremont Graduate School in California. Thomas has been researching the Asian art of stone appreciation for over 20 years and has traveled extensively throughout Asia. With his wife, Hiromi Nakaoji, they have authored and co-authored over 50 papers and the book Chrysanthemum Stones, The Story of Stone Flowers in 2010. Elias authored four additional books, The Viewing Stones of North America in 2014, The Spirit Stones with Kim and Hugh in 2014, Viewing Stones of the Yunnan Province in 2018, and Contemporary Viewing Stone Displays with Richard Turner and Paul Harris in 2020. Elias has lectured on viewing stone and served as a judge for stone exhibitions in seven countries. 
The website for the Viewing Stone Association of North America was established in 2012 and it attracts over 10,000 visitors each month from 115 countries. Also with us tonight is Virginia Moon, the Associate Curator of Korean Art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. At LACMA, she curated the traveling exhibition, Treasures from Korea, Arts and Culture of the Joseon Dynasty, 1392 to 1910, and a solo exhibition of works by Kore Korean American artist, Young Il An, Unexpected Light, in 2017 to 2018. She holds degrees from Yale, Harvard, and the University of Southern California. Her research interests and lectures range from ancient to contemporary arts. She co-authored the major exhibition, Beyond the Line, The Art of Korean Writing in 2019, which was the first in a series of three shows supported by the Hyundai Project, Korean Arts Scholarship Initiative, a global exploration of traditional and contemporary Korean art. Beyond the Line was the first writing exhibition of its kind outside Asia. And the award-winning exhibition catalog is the first contribution published in English on the subject. Her next upcoming shows will include a solo show for contemporary Korean ink master, Park Dai Sung in the fall of 2021 and a major exhibition on modern art from Korea, the first in the United States called The Space Between, the Modern and Korean Art, which is scheduled for the fall of 2022. Also with us tonight, we have two artists in the exhibition, Andy Morline, he's an internationally exhibited sculptor. His work has been shown in museums, sculpture gardens and galleries from Alaska to New York, Switzerland to Peru. Mr. Morline has extensive resume of public artworks and site-specific monumental outdoor sculptures. In October, 2020, he completed his second commission for Crystal Park, a private sculpture garden in Holmes, New York. His work can be seen at Contemporary Arts International in Acton, Massachusetts, the Verbier 3D Foundation in the Swiss Alps, Haskell Public Gardens in New Bedford, Massachusetts, at the Andres Institute in Brookline, New Hampshire, at the Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Massachusetts, and in private locations nationally. Also with us tonight, we have Elisa Pritzker, an artist and independent curator based in Ulster County, New York. She has exhibited at MoMA in Queens and the Dorsky Museum among innumerable group and solo shows. Her art's in the permanent collections of the Dorsky Museum, the Jean Cherki Art Collection in Paris, France and New York, New York, the Brooklyn Library, the Hammond Museum in upstate New York, the Argentine Consulate in New York City and the Luz and Alfonso Castillo Foundation. Elisa has been featured in many publications such as Hyperallergic, CNN, Chronogram Magazine, the Huffington Post, the PBS Channel and the New York Times. So without further ado, I think we'll start with our first presentation from um, Thomas Elias. Okay, well, I'm delighted to be part of this. And I wanted to say that my fascination with the use of stones as aesthetic objects goes back to 1978, June 1978, when I was invited to travel through throughout China as guest of the Chinese Academy of Sciences looking at research facilities and at classical gardens. And on that trip and subsequent trips, I realized that certain types of unusual stones were appreciated for their beauty and for their evocative nature. And from that point on, I began to study the Asian stones and how the Asian cultures appreciated stones. I saw ancient thousand year old stones used as musical instruments, types of Ling Bi stones that resonated. I saw stones that were a focus of many poems, prose and paintings. In fact, it was obvious that stones occupied a niche in Asian culture, especially Chinese culture that we don't see in Western culture. As one Chinese as one specialist of Chinese art wrote, 
the stone is to Chinese artists what the nude is to Western artists. And I think that's true. Now, I have a few slides to show you. If we could go to the first one, Donna. Yes. Ah. Well, let me <laughs> we'll interrupt. We'll interrupt the presentation for a short commercial. This is our latest book, Contemporary Viewing Stone Displays, done with Richard Turner and Paul Harris. And it provides a refreshing new way to look at stone displays, building on the tradition of Asian culture. Okay, next. This is the, a Chinese Lingbi stone from Anhui province in Eastern China from Lingbi County where it gets its name. And these stones, as I said, have been collected and used as uh, ornamental objects, aesthetic objects for well over a thousand years. There's a 900 year old publication that mentions this as, as the number one stone of China. It's a marine limestone and uh, it occurs at near, the, at near the surface and underneath the surface. And stones like this would be, this would be face down in the earth and the groundwater would filter through that over hundreds of thousands of years, eroding away the softer stones and leaving the, the very unusual shapes. So these stones were discovered as far back as the Song Dynasty when they became popular in China. They were brought in to courtyards and displayed. And one of the fascinating things about the Ling Bi stones is that most of them resonate. You can strike it with a little metal object or hammer and you get a tone. And this also, uh, these Ling Bi stones where it was laid down, it wasn't water eroded, but they had flat deposits of this limestone. They're taken and cut into different shapes and used as musical instruments. As a, as a xylophone, you would strike or hung and struck. And so the literati in China were fascinated by these stones and they would sit around and discuss the meaning of it and how it related to um, their beliefs. And so it's, it's one of the best, one of the most popular types and they're still being produced, they're still being dug out of the earth uh, today in, in Anhui province. Okay, let's go to the shift to the next slide. The next slide is a Japanese stone from the Kamo River near Kyoto, Japan. Uh, this isn't an abstract shape at all. In fact, you don't see many abstract shaped stones in Japanese stone culture, which they call suizeki. Uh, certainly the Japanese stone culture was influenced by Chinese and Korean aspects of stone appreciation and was taken to Japan by monks from Korea. Uh, also in Japan, the formal tea ceremony has influenced the way that people look at uh, native stones. And so the concept of subtleness, elegant beauty, understated beauty has influenced stone appreciation in Japan. So they like stones that resemble or evoke aspects of nature. This would be a single mountain uh, or a ridge, a series of mountains, or plateau, or waterfall. Uh, in Japan, they have a preference for darker colored stones because they feel it looks older, uh, more feeling of oldness and antiquity. So in Japanese stones, you have the shape and color, the texture, the composition of the stone, it should be hard, not soft, and a feeling of oldness. Okay, now we'll shift to the third stone. This is a uh, Korean chrysanthemum flower stone. And in Korea, flower pattern stones are popular. They're well liked. The chrysanthemum flower and the sunflower are two of the more uh, sought after types of stones. And these stones are appreciated as well as stones that uh, give a feeling of longevity and of people's struggles with, with difficulties. And so in Korean stones, if I understand it, you have to ha have 
a feeling or interaction with the stones. You can't just look at the stone and say, oh, that's a nice rock, but it should evoke some feelings in you. Now this flower pattern stone is resting in a very typical Korean style base with the short uh, bulbous legs to it. It's a very attractive stone, one of my favorites. Now we'll go to the final stone I wanna to talk to you about. And this is a North American stone. Stone appreciation came to North America in uh, perhaps the 1960s, 1950s, following along with the introduction of bonsai. There was a second introduction uh, to North America of Koreans, or of, I'm sorry, of Chinese stones. Those tend to come with antiques being introduced into North America. So you can see at the Boston Museum, one of the earliest uh, stones that were, was brought into the, the United States a little over a hundred years ago. And so we have a smaller Chinese element, people that collect Chinese stones and then people that collected Japanese stones. Well, this influenced people to look out and begin to look for stones in North America, in the mountains and rivers. This particular stone, it's a, it's a large one, is from the Southern California desert. It's petrified wood, which is real, truly stone. <laughs> and I put it with a uh, Indian drum because I feel that it's important to develop a North American concept of stone appreciation. It's fine to be informed and know about the uh, Chinese and Korean and Japanese ways of appreciating stones, but eventually we need to take our own stones and pair it with uh, North American artifacts to create a North American display. And so I've taken an authentic Indian drum and the colors in the drum match the colors in the stone. So this is one type of um, stone that's found in North America. There are many people out searching now. And so the ho hobby of stone appreciation has spread from Asia to Australia, all throughout Southeast Asia, to North America, South America, and throughout Europe. And so there's a fairly thriving culture or group of people throughout the world now that are, are collecting and appreciating stones, building on the long tradition of Asian stone appreciation. Okay, I think I've used up my five minutes, Donna. Okay, thank you so much, Tom. And thank you for loaning this beautiful, we are so fortunate. This piece is in the uh, Korean Cultural Center show right now. So thank you for uh, loaning that um why don't we why don't we move into andy i think tom had you know introduced the idea of contemporary artists responding to this tradition so let's um since he wanted to go last if that's okay we'll um skip ahead towards andy my warmest thanks to everyone the korean cultural center <coughs> um curator donna dodson the artists and all the guests all the wonderful guests I see on, this, on the, uh, the Zoom call. Thank you so much for coming. Um, many artists speak politically, conceptually, or materialistically. Um, I tend to live my art more personally and more emotionally. Um, and so that's where I start from. I grew up in Alaska in public school and escaped at 17, a young hippie who got shipped out to the East Coast as far as I could get away from my parents who weren't quite as liberal as my leanings were at that moment in time. And I went to college to cross country ski. Um, somehow I found myself in really exceptional classes, geology, biology, literature, drama, set design. And um, I thought I'd take an easy A and sign up for an American art history survey class. Um, Hudson, <laughs> the Hudson River School just spoke to me. Their grand nature and the small man. You know, at the same time I was reading um, transcendental literature and there was just so much sense to this young Alaskan boy who couldn't really understand what all these other people were talking about. Um, and it was really interesting. Um, but as we closed the term, we had two weeks exhilarating weeks of Abex, de Kooning and Frankenthaler, Pollock. 
I mean, people who just threw stuff on the canvas. And I, I stood there and I trained my rabbit hunting eyes on Jackson and I saw the colors and the, the monotony and the evenness that a snow blind burn holds when you look at too much snow and your eyes just ache. I was totally hooked. Um, Japan's Roanji. Don, are you gonna give me my PowerPoint at some point? No hurry. Are you ready uh, for it? Not yet, soon. I'm sorry, you were going to give me the blank slide. I was nervous that we were lost. <laughs> okay, um, uh, the raking distance mountains represented by stones. I have seen across vast glaciers to those exact mountains. It spoke to me. I said, oh gosh, this is so familiar. Um, go ahead, first slide. Okay, we're ready. This is just a um, snapshot of the installation of Andy's work in the exhibition. Aha, Le Cheval and Pale Wave. I make art to describe the power that moves me. Hokusai's wave and Raymond duchamp Villon's Le Cheval are married. They're fun pieces. Every time I make a piece, I realize that when I'm working with scholars rocks, as much as I'm working with abstractions, I'm also working with all the art history my mind is just stuffed full of. And I just can't escape it. With COVID, one of the biggest disappointments I've had is going to galleries and accidentally experiencing things that I might not have planned to see. Right now, all I see is what I bring up on my computer. Next slide, please, Donna. Okay, here we go. Besides being a cross-country skier, I hiked a trap line into the mountains above my home in Anchorage at least every other day, all through the winter. This to the left is Willowaw Lakes, an area that I, I scoured and climbed and hiked through daily for many, many years of my young, young very young life. Um, and this, my work, Uncharted. So the crystal blue glacial pocket lakes is cold as winter in the hot summer and the oak rotted voids in my stump stand in for water. Glacier worn valleys and water gouged canyons in my wood uncharted transport me. We're talking about portals today. And I think that there's something about scholars rocks that always seem to send me into a place that I so wanted to imagine. Next, Donna. Okay. Georgia O'Keeffe. Many artists have captured unique moments and unique places. When I landed for the first time in Albuquerque and I stepped out and I looked up, I said, oh, oh, there it is. I'd never seen it before. There's the Pedernal. I knew it from Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings. When I cut off this chunk of oak and it fell on my floor and I looked at it, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. And I picked it back up and I handled it around and I said, this has got a little work on it. And so this is where I ended up. Next slide. Okay. Today, I'm channeling the slip and slide roller coaster of COVID life into a chunk of maple, seeking, seeking to understand it better and myself and this moment. And on the left, I use ink and wash to try to understand myself a little bit better with color. I'm so afraid to color my painted, my stone, my uh, wood stones. Um, wood is such a beautiful medium and I so have so many painters that I love and want to uh, somehow imitate. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Andy. That was lovely. Um, <coughs> Elisa, do you want to go next? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Okay. Well, like everybody else, uh, thank you, Donna, for these long, you know, hours of work. And the KCC, the amazing group of colleagues in the exhibition and the amazing group of presenters. I'm so pleased to see this group of people that I'm in awe. And I barely want to talk, but I will, just a few minutes. Um, I want to say first that for me, 
everything that we do in life is a ceremony, everything. So for me, this one, this encounter is also a ceremony. And I want to explain where my work is coming from, the current work. I visited Patagonia and 15 years ago, I was born in Argentina, but I left the country a long, long ago. And I visited Patagonia and the last tip of the continent is called the city is called the city at the end of the world is the logo and the name of the city is Ushuaia. So I visited there with the friends from the US and since we were speaking English all the time, I left them for a few minutes walking in the mountain and a warm, fresh and warm air touched my face. And I asked if they felt the wind and say nobody felt the wind. And I said, I'm touched by the land. I had to go back home and find out who was living in this, in this area before all this tourism. And I encountered the Selknam native people that lived in the territory 10,000 years before all the European came to, the, to South America. So since I'm really, you know, immersed in an ongoing research from the, about the Selknam people, I began gathering like they were gather, gatherers and hunters. And I began gathering rocks. So I became a gatherer too. Every place that I went, I gathered a rock. And it was also a ceremonial moment. And the same that happens with the, the scholar rocks, I don't carve, I don't touch, I just do, a, I paint on them. I don't transform their shapes. I continue a conversation with my paint on the rocks that I've been gathering for many, many years. And I also consider that that is magical and is part of my ritual. So I feel that I'm connected with the scholar rocks by using rocks that I found, by painting them with my own iconography. You can uh, show any of the slides now. You can begin. So this is again, just a, um, just an overview of Elisa's installation in the exhibition. So we'll go to your first slide. Yes, uh, as you can see, the uh, small rocks came from the from Oaxaca, Mexico, the Pacific Ocean. They are very soft. They are unbelievable, easy to paint for me, and they are a wonderful, magical conversation. You can show the the close up of those of those uh, stones. Those stones are around three inches, uh, you know, the size is more or less three inches high. And what I do is I just touch the, the stone and let the stone to tell me the story. The icons are, are a, an iconography that I created. And I was told by a certain shaman that uh, every stone uh, tells you a story. So I, I just, patiently uh, stay in my studio and I hold the stone and the, I start painting and I let the, the stone tell me the story. So every, every stone is different and every moment is different. Uh, you can go to the next one. Okay. Um, let's see, there it goes, okay. Well, this is part of the installation. It's called Bird of Peace and Hope. And since I began creating this iconography, I translated the iconography to other materials, not only to stones. In this case, it's a canvas. And if you, can you go back to the first uh, image? This one. No, the first one. 
Yes. As you can see in the, insta the, the other one, the full installation, Donna. Yes. As you can see after the, the canvas, there is a, a line of tiny, tiny stones that go to encounter a bigger stone. Um, I use uh, for many, many uh, installations, I use the stones and I'm really think that they have they have life that is, they are not a, you know, they have their own life and they are part of nature the way that we are too. So I think that I'm done. I thank you again and I'm open to questions. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And now, uh, Virginia, would you like the floor? Oh, sure, why not? I'd like to thank you, like I started it earlier. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for, for your intro, but more importantly, for inviting me to be part of this project. Um, I want to also thank Andy Moreland and the other nine artists for doing what you do and bringing them to us in this space. <clears throat> And finally, I would like to thank the Korean Cultural Center for their conti for continuing to support projects like this to broaden our understanding of Asian art. Um, I have a very short disclaimer. Um, there's really not that much written on uh, Korean uh, tradition of stones like there is uh, in China. Um, in Korea, they're called suzok. <laughs> um, Waller's Rocks, and um, but also it's hard to be able to explain everything if that's even possible in a short period of time. So just just to say that if anybody, if I'm tugging at anyone's heartstrings to go out tomorrow to Korea and start gathering Suzuk and writing a book, <laughs> please go ahead and do that. Um, we need more information. Um, so basically roughly after the 13th century, so end of Song China, and at this point, you know, uh, we, Korea's history, cultural history certainly has to be uh, talked about vis-a-vis -vis China because China was such an important influence. Um, Korea emulated the respect for rocks in its literary literati circles in the form of Kwezo. Now Kwezo, which is the Korean word, literally means the awkwardly shaped rocks. And you know, in English that might be like an insult, but in actuality, that's actually a magnificent thing to say about a rock. Um, uh, and it's closer. I mean, what the Korean literati respected and started wanting to collect was closer to the shapes that um, Tom showed us um, and that are uh, continued to be found in China. But, you know, this, this sort of dedication, I feel, has petered out over time. That's not to say it doesn't exist. It's not to say there is absolutely a museum on rocks, on Suzuk, um, and absolutely there are collectors. But again, compared to um, the dedication that I've seen and watched China um, have, uh, I think it's different. Um, but like I said, it doesn't mean that Koreans did not respect the idea of it. Uh, what remained in Korea as time goes on is a value put on rocks that you could actually hold, that you could hold with your hands. Um, and obviously, if you've ever seen, you know, the gigantic Chin Chinese scholar rocks, you know you can't hold that in your hand without causing harm to yourself. Um, uh, but also it's the idea of a manifestation of landscape. Now that's a common theme. Um, and I was thinking about that. Why is that the case uh, in Korea? Um, and at the moment, I attribute it to the particular geology of Korea, that you know the kinds of rocks and rock sediments that exist on the peninsula don't necessarily lend themselves to the shapes that we see in, in China. Um, so then the question becomes, so now what do, what do these Korean Suzuk rocks look like? So we'll start with the first slide. I have just four. Okay, and the first slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so um, this, is, this is quite a famous piece. Um, it's called a Chekgori. 
Um, and uh, these, these usually came out kind of in vogue um, in the late 18th century and 19th century. Um, and these are screens, <clears throat> excuse me, of quote things called um, tekori. And by things, we're talking about objects associated, um, uh, meaning the objects that you see on, on these shelves. They're not real shelves. This is a painting. Um, associated with the upper class and scholars and literati. And you know, I've I, I've kind of you know skipped over a couple centuries here, but I did that because it's with the chequery that I can I can show you um, that this type of artwork. Um, there's a lot to say here, and I'm sort of jumping over a lot of things here. But these were commissioned by newly rich merchants, and in Korea, certainly in other countries in Asia, the merchant class was considered the lowest class in society. But because they were so wealthy, um, they wanted to kind of surround themselves with these objects that, um, you know, gave themselves the impression of like virtue, character, intellect, in, in, uh, intelligence, um, etc. Right. Um, now, it's kind of a complicated thing, which is why I'm just going to leave it at that for now. There's a lot written on it in English. Um, but, you know, these were put together and put in these merchant families' uh, houses, living spaces, um, to socially elevate themselves. Um, and Donna's mouse yes. is going to point out, oh, there's her mouse. I hope you can see it. It's going to point out um, where the two scholars' rocks are here, right? Um, and so you, you see these sort of, you know, um, beautiful pieces, but they're not, they're, they're paintings um, that are on this shelf. Um, next, next um, if you want to read more about the Chekori, there was recently an exhibition on this, a traveling exhibition called Chekori. And a few years back, there was a Treasures of Chozon show. So if it does interest you, please, um, you know, there's more to read there. Um, the next PowerPoint. Right. So if you look at this, this looks nothing like what Tom showed us. Um, I mean, it's, it's very interesting in and of itself in that it has sort of this puddle of water in the middle. Um, uh, and it's sitting in a puddle of water uh, with sand. Um, but it's very flat. It's very low. Um, and, you know, unlike uh, some of the Chinese rocks that Tom showed us, the, the base is not molded to the rock. The base is trying to extend the size of the rock, kind of like a garden landscape, you know, adding to the rock. Um, next one. Um, Okay, so now we're talking about a couple things here. Um, you see this stone and it is molded. I mean, th this looks to be a base that has been um, custom made to hold this rock. Um, I think I should keep my opinions to myself about this rock, but <laughs> I, I put this here because I wish I could hold it. I wish I could touch it. I wish I could see it because from where I'm sitting, it looks like a very porous rock. And to be a porous rock is not an acceptable trait in Chinese scholars rocks. Um, so I, I, I just, this was a kind of a question mark to me. And I just put this here as a way to share my question mark with all of you. Um, next one, mm -hmm. and final one. Apparently, the whole reason why suddenly people are so interested in Suzuk, and that's not to hold back the people who have had a love for this for many decades, but um, when I saw this movie and I saw the Suzuk, because that's what this is, and there's so much written on it now, um, I said, well, that's the best looking Suzuk I've ever seen in, in Korea. Um, and I haven't seen that many, so that's a little bit unfair to say, but I had to just pair it up with what I thought was the closest um, 
uh, in, in, in overall uh, feel look uh, to the Suzuki rock in Parasite. Um, and again, I'm working off the assumption that this movie kind of reset the interest in Asian rocks. And um, like I said, if you see the Suzuki rock I'm showing you on the right, this is from the Museum of Suzuki Puchan, Korea. So there is actually a museum dedicated to these rocks, but they look very different from China, Chinese rocks and Japanese rocks. Um, and again, if you look at the base, um, I understand in some of the reading in, in Korean that I've read is that uh, Koreans have this habit of like slicing the bottom so that it'll just sit nice. Um, but when I read that, I, I shudder because it's like, why would you, why would you cut something that is normally happening in nature? But that's my personal opinion. Um, and like I said, there's more that I'd like to know um, and more I wish that was available both in Korean and in English. But I'm gonna move on. Those are my PowerPoints, but I wanna really move on because what I quickly realized in talking to Donna and to Andy is that this is really a show about how people now are interpreting um, these rocks. And, you know, I thought about why do we have these differences shown by um, China, Japan, and Korea? And it made me realize that those differences and how each country's people thought about their rocks really opened the way for the differing reactions and thus portrayals that I think we see in this show. And it's also, um, if I may say, if I may go on out on this limb, a reflection of our times. Uh, meaning in China and Korea, the parameters for a scholar's rock was consistent. Um, and it reflected the rigid society um, at the time. You know, no one can tell me that people then weren't creative and, and, and imaginative, but, um, you know, they followed a certain social rule um, and there was a reverence attached to that. Um, and so I, my exposure to the 10 artists in this show, unfortunately, is limited to the interviews you've had with Donna. I'm sorry that I haven't had a chance to meet with you and to see this show in person, um, but I did pick up some of the things that you said, and I, I, I hope I'm using it as you intended. Um, as Furin Dai mentions, you know, um, back in China, these rocks were really a form of commodification. And I do agree that there's an aspect to that. But then I see Umin Kim's um, sort of embroidery. I don't know if people who are listening have had the chance to see, um, but she has these sort of small five by five square frames along the wall. Um, and the 2D-ness of it reminds me of the idea of the 2D-ness of Chekori. I'm not saying that that's where she got her inspiration from, but that's what I thought of when I saw her works. Um, Christopher Frost mentioned, you know, in, in his interview, the mix of East and West. But, you know, yeah, I, I would have said that before, but I think today it goes beyond that. A rock is a rock is a rock, no matter where you are in the world. And the rock, doesn't discriminate. Um, I think that's very, um, yeah, we should, you know, listen to the rock. Um, Susan's work, to me, most baldly juxtaposes the old and the new. And in particular, I'm thinking of her acrylic, huge structure, and then she's got the ancient stones sitting on them. And it's just like saying clash and yet harmony um, between the past and the present. Um, and then finally, you know, Mark Cooper uh, talked about the interplay between man and nature. And I realized that the theme of man and nature, we, we bring it up all the time. You know, the West brings it up, the East brings it up, the North brings it up, the South brings it up, right? But, you know, um, the man-nature interaction is borne out in different ways in this show. Um, uh, to me, again, uh, Laura Canamella, um, her works, um, they're, they're small, but if you ever get a chance to walk up there and look at what she's done, these rocks are defiant. 
they're 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 beautiful and they're defiant. And then, um, you know, and then right, like near her, there are these shelves with these small, really, really attractive rocks, but they're small. And to me, they seem so like, I'm just going to borrow nature for a minute. I'll return it to you in two weeks. You know, just a sense of a very different attitude. That, that's all I'm juxtaposing here. Um, you know, um, and I may be completely off my rocker, but you know, um, so sort of very different attitudes to me, um, unlike uh, the scholar's rock of old. And this is because today the individual is allowed to be recognized. That wasn't true back in China, uh, you know, 15th, 16th, 17th century or in Korea or in Japan. But these different ways also well reflect what is going on today. What am I talking about? Man versus COVID. COVID's nature. We don't like it very much, but it's nature. Um, man, climate change. And like, can we do something or is it just too late, right? But I would also add man versus our inner selves. Um, I think there's a lot of infighting with ourselves that people do today. Um, so the microcosms of the works that I saw produced by each of these artists presented here are universal, they're relatable, and individual. But most of all, the works literally speak to us, not unlike the scholar stones. So Elisa said this in her interview, you have brought the past into the present and I add, which redefines the future. I'd like to leave you with one related but random question. Um, I was thinking about everybody talking about how it feels, how it looks, how it makes them feel. And I thought to myself, if you took people who are blindfolded or people who are naturally blind and you let them in the gallery and let them sort of touch, I mean, gently, you know, um, would they be able to see what you feel? And it was just a curiosity question. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. That was stunning. Um, really enjoyed your remarks. And thank you for opening it up to also think about um, all the work in the show. Um, so I could, if people want to see, I could show us you a few images or we can just take questions. Um, Let's see. Does anyone have a question? Maybe it's one place to start. Um, I will, let's see. Is there, yeah. Is there I a- I love to see images. Okay, let's, I'll just share my screen and we can just look at a few, few more images. So these are just um, some installation photos I took. As you walk in the exhibition, we had two of Kim and Hugh's stones that we borrowed from her personal collection. Uh, she lives in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, as you walk, this is uh, Fear and Dye's uh, prints on the wall next to one of Chris Frost's um, actually concrete um, casting of a stone. Um, Furin, uh, let's see, I think I have a close up one just of her work. Oh, I don't. Um, actually, you can see it a little bit to the left. It's called How to Move a Scholar's Rock. It is funny and irreverent. Um, and this, this is Chris Frost sculpture in the middle on the red stand, another of his concrete sort of, you know, made stone, not a real stone. And then um, you can see Andy Morline's work in the background, uh, Laura Moriarty over here. Um, so let's get another close up picture. This is uh, Mark Cooper's work. It's a combination of um, painting on canvas, uh, the ceramic, ceramic on the back. This is Julie's work in the background. She does really intimate um, ink on paper work. Um, we, we looked at Elise's. Um, this is Julie's work. Um, she calls these viewing stone, bonsai and terrarium. So again, taking on, um, you know, ancient um, traditions with a very contemporary twist. Um, this was Laura Moriarty's work. She spoke at our last talk. She works with wax. These are actually wax. They look like geodes. And then she 
um, melts them and uh, drags them across these sort of larger scrolls. Um, let's see, Andy's work again, and then Laura Canamila's in the background. Um, Virginia was referencing their stone-like qualities. Those are actually um, ceramic and reference the landscape. This is another installation view. You can see, I have a close-up one of uh, Susan Meyer right there. We talked about the acrylic, the acrylic work and Wu Means is in, there's a closer one of Susan Meyers. Um, and I love, she has this little thinker, like a scholar in the middle of this one. It's actually a woman, which I also love. Um, and then moving along here, this is Wu Means work a combination of the textiles and also the found object, smaller sculptures. And then I think we're back to the, this again, like sort of a long shot of the gallery. Um, another sort of close up of Wumin's. There, that's a better one of the textiles that are very flat as Virginia was pointing out. Those were based on a residency she did at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And she'll, um, She'll be in our November 13th conversation. So I think that gives you a sense, sort of a feel of, as you walk through the gallery, some conversations that the works have amongst themselves. This is the stone that Thomas and Hiromi lent to the exhibition. And this is the back of Mark Cooper's sculpture. I wanted to show that. Um, so yes, I loved your, I loved your, um, tying the uh, variety of interpretations into, um, into uh, yeah, contemporary culture here in the United States. So um, with that, I think we could take a few questions and um, did anyone wanna, um, had a burning question? They were hoping they would. I have a question uh, for Virginia. Hi, Tom. Hi. Virginia, do you know what the earliest reference in Korean to a stone appreciated for its aesthetic qualities or stones? I'm gonna have to sit down and compare the dates because actually I know of um, paintings done by literary scholars of stones in the vein of appreciation. So, you know, I need to peel off those dates to kind of get a sense of how early that happened. So I'll contact you later about this. Okay. Thanks. Sounds good. Sure, no problem. I see we have a question in the um, chat. How long did it take to assemble this group of artists? And what drew me to the artists to bring them into the show? And I'll just say briefly, like a, like a lot of shows, it's it's been a long time in the making. We had a few venues, um, you know, come and go. So we're just really honored that we've been able to pull this together for the Korean Cultural Center. Um, you know, due to COVID, we're, we have the opportunity to use Zoom and bring a much larger um, pool of experts into the conversation that I'm not sure we would have thought about prior to Zoom. So the exhibition has changed with the times, with the moment, with technology. Um, and what drew me to the artists? I think that um, personally, I've always found the concept kind of esoteric and hard to understand. I mean, I think we can all identify with the idea of finding a stone on the beach and picking it up and admiring it, maybe thinking of the day, maybe even pet rocks, you know, the idea of them looking at us as well as us looking at them. Um, but I think, you know, artists, I've looked, I've turned to contemporary artists to help me understand this better and just doing studio visits. And once you start looking for Scholar's Rock, it felt like um, it was sort of an organic process of doing a studio visit and someone saying, you really should know this artist. You should really know this artist. Um, it just really became kind of a community um, putting the show together and a series of conversations that we've now been able to take online. Um, it looks like we have one more uh, question is there a correlation between these stones and ancestor worship? Does anyone want to comment on that? Well, uh, I, I already mentioned, uh, I don't know if it is a correlation, but my work brings the, the shamanic power from the ancestors to the present. And like Virginia said, uh, it will go from there to the future. I don't think that uh, we can build 
a good present and a good future if we don't understand the past. I think there is no fraction. It is a, it, it is a, something that is important to know, but also we have a contemporary view into that. But I, I, I believe that there is a, like, like a really, you know, ancestors, our ancestors are with us. That's what I, I think, that we are the present, but we have the ancestors in, in the ether, just to say one way, you know. I don't think there is no, a strong correlation between the stone appreciation and ancestor worship. I think more the stone appreciation is more tied into the appreciation and respect for nature and living in harmony mm -hmm. with nature and appreciating mm -hmm. it rather than tying with ancestor worship. Ditto. Okay, um, I have one more question. Andy, your mountain sits on a table that's walking. How do you decide on the basis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting thing. I spend a lot of time looking at Brancusi, um, a gallery full of small scholar's rocks on big white bases makes it an overwhelmingly white based show. So I started putting my rocks on, on little bases and there's a great um, relationship between bases and scholars rocks since the rocks were started to be bring, brought indoors. When they were in the garden, they always were surrounded by greenery and they would just settle them in, maybe stick some cementitious materials and hold them in place. When they brought them indoors, it was like, how do we place this? And um, you know, viewing stones were sometimes leveled in their little base and sometimes set in sand in a tray. And um, the Chinese quite often set them on these very elaborate carved uh, bases. And I'm just, I'm as intrigued by those. I think so often you can take a rock and have a base made and it's like, all of a sudden the rock is elevated. It's separated from the ordinary. It's not just a rock, it's a rock on a base. And um, there's but the a conference is also said. I'm sorry, Virginia. Oh no, the converse of what you said is also true. That if a rock doesn't have a base, it's not anything. <laughs> yeah. People say that, you know. Well, you know, I, I, <laughs> Donna. Somebody asked me uh, how I what paint I use, and I want to say that I use acrylic and resin both uh, as a combination just for for painting rocks okay i just wanted to answer that somebody wanted to know they are all uh, water-based acrylics uh, and yeah okay well, the evolution okay. the evolution of the base is a very interesting study because some of the earliest stones were simply placed on a a small display table or on a cloth or something and then eventually the, the, the bases were developed, the socket bases were developed I mean, in the Ming Dynasty and later. So there's a, a real evolution of the base. And you're, Andy, you're continuing that, that evolving nature of the bases. And I read about that, Tom, in your journal. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Tom knows a lot. Okay, Andy's one more question for Andy. It looks like Andy's beautiful work and talk about it showed formal analogies between landscapes or artworks. When I look at his work, I feel the flow of energies like viewing stones and body. Does Andy feel the materiality of things in the making of the works? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, that's a very beautiful question. And I guess um, the thing that I see in, um, you know, I guess I'll go back to Abex and that idea of the impassioned artist spilling the paint, you know, Frankenthaler pouring on canvases and watching it just flow and how accidental her canvases and yet how incredibly controlled they were. And um, I, I tend to shy away from valuing abstraction. It's painful for me. Abstraction is the most incredible conundrum because it seems so accidental. And yet in that pursuit <laughs> of meaning in the accident, I find myself totally alive. 
So yes, yeah. I find the spirit of the, the wood communicates. I work with it. I seek something. And um, sometimes it makes something pretty and sometimes uh, it just sits there. Nobody likes it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Are there any other, any closing comments or questions? Donna, uh, just to just to close my part, I would like to thank everybody again. And I want to post a comment. When we talk about nature, I want to include humankind because I, I don't feel the separation between rocks, trees, and humans. I think that we are all part of nature. I just want to mention it because I feel that sometimes we put the rock there like it's like something that doesn't have life. And I want to just mention my own concept that I feel that everything is connected and man is part of, is not separated from nature. I want to just close my remarks saying that we are all in, this, in different parts of nature, but we are part of it. We are not separated. I think that that is one of the things that is very important, not to cause any harm to nature. We are part of it. So that, that is, I want to say before we leave, and I thank you for putting together this amazing exhibit. Thank you, Elisa, and thank Le you again. Elisa, you said that stones do not have life, but if no, we take that, I, No, I say the opposite. I say that some people think that oh, a stone, okay. no, I, it's per the <laughs> contrary. That's why I was saying that a, you know, when I when I grab a stone, it's talking to me. That is what I was saying. Ah, that good. It's, that is not separate. Like some people, they think that is a piece of, you know, the stone and the tree and the animals. We are part of nature, and that is what helps us to respect nature when we feel that we belong and we are part of it. That's yeah. what I said, Tom. Yeah. If we if we stop and listen to the stones, they will speak to us. Definitely. That's what I said. So thank you. I enjoyed this very much. Yes. Thank you we again. The, thank you, Andy, in, Dama. Thank, thank you, you Tom. And thank, thank you, Elisa. Um, I just like to close by saying that um, this is the second conversation in a series of five conversations. So um, two things, this talk is being recorded. So we will have a recording of this if you missed part of it or came in late or you wanna share it with a friend of yours. The link will be available on the Korean cultural website, www.koreanculture.org. Our next talk will be Tuesday, November 10th at 5 p.m. on Zoom. It's going to feature Yao Wu, the curator of Asian art at the Smith College Museum of Art Kevin Greenwood, the curator of Asian art at the Allen Memorial Art Museum and Oberlin College. Julie Kang will be Zooming from Korea, one of the artists in the show, and Laura Canamila will also be joining us. So I hope you can all join us on November 10th. Thank you so much for Zooming in tonight. Thanks for our speakers and all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.